Welcome to Sacred Cow Shipyards, where no ship is safe from being taken down to its nuts and bolts. I feel like I'm saying this more often than I am comfortable with, but occasionally Star Wars does get close to something approximating a good idea. I mean, it's rare, it's erratic, they typically squander it on something totally useless, as is almost the case in this case, and it's terribly not consistent, but still, for all the grief I give Star Wars, and I should give it more grief than I do, they do occasionally come up with, you know, a truffle instead of a turd, or whatever that saying is. And the really funny thing is that this particular ship we're talking about today is the closest thing to a Star Wars technical I think there might be. And for those of y'all who do not know, a technical is a very specific term on your planet. And no, it has absolutely nothing to do with having specially and unusually practical knowledge, especially of my mechanical or scientific subject, although as I read that definition, I realize that is not entirely the case. Because somebody had to know something about mechanical subjects in order to build technicals. And while the definition has, of course, expanded over the years as such things happen, the original technical was a Toyota Hilux with a 50 cal machine gun somehow mounted in the bed and used in warfare, typically in the Middle Eastern generic area of your globe. And yes, for those of y'all trapped in the USA and province on your planet, the Toyota Hilux is in fact still being produced, although most of the technicals are built out of the older models. You know, the ones that you could actually import because your stupid government has stupid laws that have stupid regulations, and instead people are going out in the desert and blowing them up in warfare. Such a goddamn shame. Anyways, the official term for technicals is a non-standard tactical vehicle, otherwise an NSTV. Technical is much easier to say. And they are simply reliable, durable vehicles that have a weapon hard-mounted to them, and they go off and fight. And specifically, they're reliable, durable, and cheap. Which, of course, Toyota Hilux is outside of the U.S. fill that bill pretty easily. And no, it doesn't have to be a Toyota Hilux. And no, it doesn't have to be a 50 cal. I've seen everything from, a, you know, a 308, 762 kind of machine gun all the way up to a MLRS system strapped on the back of a pickup on your planet. Which, by the way, is absolutely terrifying. But still, the entire concept is a fast-moving, cheap, reliable, durable vehicle that you strap some weapons onto, and hopefully it'll get off more than one shot. And if it doesn't, well, you didn't lose that much, so oh well. Anyways, the ship we're talking about today started its life in Legends in Star Wars, and by that I mean proper Star Wars, as nothing more than a basic armed transport. Yes, it did actually start its life armed, but basically that was an anti-piracy maneuver. And then, later, now, in canon Star Wars, that is to say Disney Star Wars, it is actually one of the primary backbones of the Imperial fleet. It's kind of amazing. And yes, I said backbones as in plural. Wait until you find out what's out there. Anyways, this week, I suppose I should actually get to the point. We are talking about the Gozanti Cruiser. Yeah. Do you know that name? Probably pretty sure you don't, unless you're a hardcore Star Wars nerd. The funny thing is this ship is f***ing everywhere. Mostly because there's like 17 f***tillion variants of it. There's the original, you know, armed transport. Then there's the Black Sun Frigate. The Sea Rock, which is a light cruiser apparently. The Balmora class. The Assault Cruiser. The IG-55 Surveillance Vessel. The Imperial Gazanti class, which is what we're going to be talking about mostly. And then there's a separatist version of it as well, and those are just the official ones. This thing is basically the ubiquitous background ship in almost every Star Wars everything. It's in Phantom Menace, it's in Attack of the Clones, it's in Battlefront 2, it's in Clone Wars, it's in Rebels, it's in Solo, it's in The Mandalorian, it's in countless comic books. In fact, it's in Rebels so much, I am shocked that they don't even, like, give it, like, some sort of, like, hero ship status. Oh no, it's just some random Imperial ship that we just keep hijacking and using for our own devices and always shows up at the worst possible time. I mean, in the pre-Disney Star Wars, it was only in Episode 1, 2, and Clone Wars. And then in the Disney Star Wars, it just exploded in popularity. Because honestly, it's one of the very few Star Wars ships that makes the slightest degree of sense. Wait, am I saying Star Wars did something close to right again? Great maker, damn it! Okay, 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 enough grousing. What actually makes a Gozanti make sense? 
Well, first off, the funny thing is that she was built to be a honker. She was actually described in Legends as a flying fortress, not as in like the bomber, just as a very problematic ship to crack if you were the kind of person to want to be cracking ships. Many a pirate was shot down by her retractable armaments, which included four heavy laser cannons and two quad laser cannon turrets, and many more pirates were stymied by her very thick hull and significant structural reinforcements. But the real funny thing of all of this, the, the absolute joke of this whole thing, is that so many of you told me that the Corellian Engineering Corporation sold the YT-1300 as a quote-unquote freighter, wink-wink, knowing that it would be used for smugglers and pirates and this, that, and the other. Well, there might be some truth to that, because the Old Republic caught wind of CEC doing interesting things, and the Gazanti cruiser was deliberately built with drives that were so slow that no pirate would ever want it. Now, yes, technically, you could actually modify those drives to get some degree of performance out of them, but it took effort, and it really wasn't worth it. You'd be better suited to go find another ship. So, they made a pretty decent pirate ship, and then they kneecapped it because of government regulations. Yeah. In the end, though, to continue the ongoing joke, it was a pretty decent anti-piracy ship. I mean, it wasn't going out there hunting the pirates, but it was carrying freight around in a very secure, very safe manner that could get from point A to point B and not be too much bothered by it. In Legends, pretty much everyone used this thing. Military, civilians, merchants, mercenaries, everyone. Because it, was, it wasn't entirely indestructible and impregnable, but it would really slow people down and it could basically independently operate. In fact, you might know one of them, a specific named one from Legends called the Crate's Honor, which was piloted by Psycho Voss, who was a regal Keldor. He pretended his ship was owned by a Humi because, of course, the Star Wars verse is very Humi-centric. But still, it was a named ship, a named actual Gazanti cruiser, as opposed to the, one of the other modification versions that we'll get to eventually. Just wait. I mean, if nothing else, the Confederacy of Independent Systems, the CIS, the, uh, what are they called? The, the Separatists had a super tactical droid named Otto. Otto? I don't know. Anyways. Um, he actually had a number of these in his fleet, a number of the Gazanti cruisers. They were that good that some droid decided that he needed to use them. And bear in mind that I'm still talking about just Legends background information. We haven't gotten to the uh, canon Disney crap yet. We're just talking about a heavily armed, you know, transport as opposed to freighter. Because Star Wars makes a difference there. And for some reason, this transport only has a cargo capacity of 75 tons and a length of 41.8 meters, whereas the YT-1300 can hold up to 100 tons and has a length of 34.75 meters. You know what? It would be really nice if someone in Star Wars could keep track of numbers. Anyways... The real joke of the Legends version of the Gazanti Cruiser to me is that, speaking of numbers, the Corellian Engineering Corporation could not keep up with demand. They could not produce Gazantis fast enough, so they licensed the design to Gallifrey Yards Incorporated. Um, well, that sounds a lot like Gallifrey to me. That's weird. Unfortunately for Gallifrey, Gallo Free also produced the GR-75 medium transport and did a sh** job of producing anything that it ever produced, to the point that it went bankrupt years before the Battle of Yavin and collapsed. Yeah, that sucks. Not gonna say who's borrowing whose name there, but damn, that's, that's a little too close to for comfort, isn't it? But again, that's all legends, and eventually we have to get to canon Disney stuff, don't we? Well... Like I said, I'll be spending most of the time talking about the Imperial Gazanti class cruiser because it's a fun one, especially given the Gazanti's history. To start with, the Gazanti had a growth spurt sometime between, you know, old Star Wars and Disney Star Wars, where it used to be 41.8 meters long, it is now 63.8 meters. It added 50% more length to itself somehow. I imagine a lot of you would be very happy if you could do the same, and yet here we are. And then the interesting thing is that the Imperial version of the Gazanti actually downgraded itself in weapons. It went from those four laser cannons and two quad laser cannon turrets to a single dorsal twin laser cannon turret and a single ventral heavy laser cannon turret. 
three guns as opposed to, you know, 12 before. So how is this a technical now? I mean, technicals are taking, you know, standard vehicles and turning them into real honest-to-God combat vehicles. Well, not maybe not real, but at least honest-to-God combat vehicles. Well, whatever. You know what I'm saying. Well, if you keep up with Star Wars design, you might remember the blockade runner, the Corellian Corvette, and how on her midsection she had four significant escape pod assemblies mounted on her ventral side. Yes, those big truncated cones sticking off the bottom of the ship in the middle are escape pod launchers. And in Legends, the Gazanti had a similar assembly mounted about the same place, and it was pretty much heavily, not explicitly stated, but pretty much heavily implied that those were in fact escape pods. Apparently Disney took one look at that idea and went, that's f***ing stupid, and whipped up a mohawk and went to town. Because while those two dishes staring at each other on the ventral side of the original Legends Gazanti were actually tractor beams meant to hold cargo pods into place, Disney didn't actually get rid of that and instead transformed the escape pod assemblies into coupling points for other ships. And not just ships, but we'll get there. So you see, the Gazanti class, this humble little armed freighter, can actually tote four TIE Fighters into combat with it, bolted to its underside, and when it gets to combat, it can dump them off and flee. Because if you look at the design of the ship and the placement of the turrets, well, they're all at the stern. That ship's not meant to stick around and fight. That ship's meant to yeet fighters into the fray and leave. Probably go get more fighters and bring them back and drop them off and flee! And I mean, it's hysterical that someone actually figured out that these docking tunnels would work perfectly with the cockpit hatch opening emplacement on ties because tie pilots actually enter the craft from the top. How they get up there is anyone's guess, given the ship doesn't have any ladders on it. I guess they have them on the, on the decks of the Star Destroyers or whatever. And yeah, the pilots just run along the corridors of the Gazanti and drop into their ties and take off and off they go. Well, yeah, that's how basically all ties work. So you can strap four TIE Fighters underneath there. You can strap four TIE Interceptors. You can strap four TIE Advanced if you want to. I guess you can't technically strap four TIE Defenders under there because they have more complicated wing assembly and four TIE Bombers might not fit. But still, it can bring a lot of hurt to the party aside from the guns it already has. But wait, 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 wait! It gets better! Do you know any other vehicles in the Star Wars universe where they pilots or operators enter through the top of the vehicle? Oh yes! ATDPs, the smaller, derpier cousins of ATSTs. Yeah, they have hatches on their tops. Guess what Gazantes can do? They can carry them around. It's not abundantly clear if the Gazantes are actually recovering these from space and bringing them to the planet, or if they're just moving them around on the planet, but it doesn't really matter. The Gazanti can operate inside of a planet's atmosphere and carry around four ATDPs and hot drop them into a combat zone and suddenly things get very exciting. But oh no, we're not done yet. While it doesn't, well, while it might not have a hatch on its top that we know of, guess what can also fit under the port and starboard wings of the Gazanti cruiser? Granted, it takes up both slots on each side, but still, it does fit and it can be carried. Oh yes, a Gazanti cruiser can actually carry two full combat-ready AT-ATs into combat and drop them into combat. Hopefully not far, because they're really bad at recovering from that. I mean, seriously, just imagine if you were some rebel insurgent, whatever the hell, fighting against the Empire, and you thought you had won the battle, and you start seeing a Gozanti stick its head up over a mountain range or something, and you're like, oh, whatever, that's just an armed transport. And then suddenly it crests a mountain ridge far higher than it needed to, and the clouds clear, and you see two AT-ATs dangling from it. That's a gut check right there. I mean, hell, just imagine the Gazanti captain telling the AT-AT operators, ah, now, nah, we're gonna keep you bolted on, just shoot everything you see. Suddenly the world turns into fire. But oh no, as I mentioned at the very beginning of this episode, the Empire was not satisfied just with turning the Gazanti into the combat carrier of all combat carriers. They had to go and make the IGV-55, which is is what happens when someone sees an AWACS on your planet and doesn't understand what it does. AWACS is kind of one of those incomplete uh, 
acronyms. It stands technically for Airborne Warning and Control System. But no one actually expands the acronym to that kind of degree. But we're going to run with it because it makes it easier. But as a parenthetical, which I can't do since I'm actually verbalizing this to you, AWACS is more commonly known as the Airborne Early Warning and Control System, otherwise known as AEWNC. That's not pronounceable. AWACS, however, Airborne Warning and Control System, totally is! So we're going to go with AWACS. Anyways, you can pick out an AWACS aircraft pretty easily, and the Air Force and the Navy of multiple nations on your planet operate aircraft that basically operate the same way as all the others. But the big significant detail is a rotating radar dome, otherwise known as a rotodome. Interesting term, that. But that's the big dish that's riding on the back of the aircraft. That lets them send out radar beams in every direction and see what's out there, see what's hanging around. Figure out where everything is. That is what AWACS job is, is to send out pulses and find everything. This is an important distinction because AWACS are active. They are actively emitting radar beams all the time because that's how they find everything. Some of the more notable examples, at least for you USAans, are the E-3 Sentry and the E-2 Hawkeye. But they're actually out there looking for things, as opposed to this particular Gazanti cruiser, the IGV-55. Instead, it is supposed to simply be listening. That's all it does. In reality, the IGV-55 is more equivalent to the Boeing RC-135 that your USA in country currently operates. And those are a complicated ball of wax as they stand. I don't know a whole lot about them. None of you know a whole lot about them because they are heavily classified by, you know, the USA ins And they are what is called a SIGINT system or possibly ELINT. It doesn't really matter. But SIGINT stands for Signals Intelligence. And ELINT stands for Electronics Signals Not Directly Used in Communication. So otherwise known as Electronics Intelligence. And this is actually the IG-55's job. Its job is not to go out and find fighters or whatever like AWACS is. Instead, it's supposed to sit out in the middle of nowhere and just listen. And see what it receives and figure out from there. That's SIGINT. That's ELINT. That's not AWACS. Why does it have the dish? Well, because someone in Star Wars' history saw the dish and thought it looked cool and tried to integrate it into something that it doesn't fit into. Ironically, the Gazanti class would be a premier level signal intelligence ship, an espionage ship. Because if from a distance, it could present itself as just an average Gazanti going about his average Gazanti day, then no one would pay the slightest bit of mind. But if you got within visual range of this thing, you're like, why does it have a big dish on top? And oh my God, why does it have four receptors even like up on a stalk above that dish? And what the f*** is going on and why am I being shot in the ass? Because I guarantee you these Gazanti intelligence cruisers are not out there by themselves. And yeah, you don't want to find one because that's a quick way to a, you know, interstellar funeral. So yeah, that background ship you saw everywhere is not actually that bad. I mean, I have some specific disagreements about some specific models of its particular development or whatever, but still, given that there are so very many versions of it, if you don't like what that salesman's trying to sell you, just go over to the next yard and I'm sure that that guy's got something that'll really twitch your little, uh, buying finger. Hmm. And that's all from Sacred Cow Shipyards. Please be advised that any ship left on the docks for more than 24 hours will be compressed to a cube at the owner's expense. Have a nice day.